became a sea captain, and then, of course, as we'll sing in the uh, song, uh, Amazing Grace, uh, during a great storm at sea, he found that he needed to trust God. And man, that really fits into our sermon this morning about trustworthiness and, and following God all the way up to the cliff and then jumping out into the abyss because God got it. So uh, if you ever get a chance, there is a, John Newton never wrote a book, but there are 11 chapters of a tiny little book of his collected letters, and it is just a phenomenal read, short read, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, but if you ever get a chance, read that book, uh, A Wonderful Man of God. Amazing Grace. I'm not sure the page number. 85. 85 in our hymnals, and I am going to make the, uh, the absolute worstful paw. I'm going to walk down and grab a hymnal. <laughs> okay. All right, page 85, my friends. Amazing grace, sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. finish my story for Vic. One of the wonderful things that John Newton did as he was shook up by that whole experience, he, he had been a, a slave trader and he was shook up by the whole experience of that storm and he left that based on moral conscience and of course I think it was 1836 in, in Great Britain that the slave trade was uh, outlawed as a part of Wilbur, Wilberforce, uh, one of the uh, English uh, parliamentarians who pushed for that, but uh, it, it was totally a God thing, and it's wonderful how God works. So where, what did John Newton do after he quits being a sea captain? He's a bi-vocational, I guess, or second vocation preacher. And where, where does he get assigned? Just outside Parliament, where he can have an influence with people about that issue of the slave trade. And it's really a, a beautiful story of how God uses us wherever we are. 
in our jobs, in our homes, in, when we go about our daily uh, routine in the grocery store or wherever it might be, God uses us. Can you turn to page? Is, is seven the one you want? Is it 701 for the doctor? Just seven. Seven. Oh, page seven. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on this a little bit later after we take some prayer and praise. Uh, I enjoy, and I have a total Tuesday faith in God, but I really enjoy some of the formal things that the Christian faith does. And one of them is that beautiful doxology. Man, if you ever get a chance... Go into a Lutheran church in Germany and, and hear them singing in German. So I didn't understand, but maybe one or two words, but hear them singing the doxology. And it's just a beautiful praise to God. Would you join me as we sing that? Page seven. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. If we can just pause for a minute and hear your praises or your prayer requests, your petitions to God. And I, I want to say thank you to Marilyn. God bless you for helping me out. <laughs> One day she's going to play uh, my, uh, the Nazarene theme song, which is in our book, Holding Us Unto the Lord. Uh, and we'll, we'll all sing that and I'll force it upon you. I'll, maybe I'll march around the aisles too because that's what we do at our uh, district meetings often all right so uh maybe that song that had jesus the nazarene in it. that's true yeah and that's right <laughs> he, he he wasn't he uh he did get baptized but he wasn't the baptist so uh, that was john uh praise the lord so uh some some praise reports sister Vic. Amen. He'll be going through what Pastor, um, Pastor's wife has gone through many times. And so we got that looking um, into, and it should be soon. And the other prayer request that I have is for Linda Wecko. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. She is sick, and um, she's been on and off sick quite a bit lately. All right. Hey, you know, the beautiful thing about prayer requests is this. Jesus said, uh, in this manner you should pray. He said, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he, he stopped, he paused in that and said, give us this day our daily bread. We are to bring our petitions to God. And, and he hears them. Any other uh, prayer requests or praises? I'll give you a praise, or uh, maybe a prayer request, I don't know, both. Uh, <laughs> I've got 12 trials that are scheduled for the, in the next two days, and I think only five will go, but, uh, you know, God gives you a lot of confidence that you just drive on. And with God as your co-pilot, or actually pilot, you just drive on, you don't need to fear whatever is in your days. And I don't know about y'all, but I freely admit I, I have always had a hard time embracing the 
words of Jesus when he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worry of his own, right? So I'm one of those guys that used to toss and turn all night. Oh, man, am I going to get this right? Am I going to do that? God got it. And, he, and I, I praise God that he's given me peace in the heart. Anybody else? A prayer or a request or a praise? Christy Orr. Is that the person we talked about a couple, three weeks ago? Um, that we're trying to? I think so. Okay. <coughs> Job, yes, Pastor. And you know what? Uh, Jesus said, uh, go and give them the gospel, get them saved, and then leave them alone. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, he said something about making disciples. So let's, let's pray, too, for Pastor Dennis to continue to reach into their lives and do what Jesus said to do. That was a, not a suggestion by Jesus. It was a command. It was a sending us forth to create disciples. Anybody else? Brother, I'm sure Daniel would appreciate uh, praying for their housing situation uh, where they've been staying. It's uh, kind of needs to come to an end within about 30 days or so. So, uh, you know, not having, you know, established credit and all that in the United States and stuff, it's not going to be easy. So just pray about that. So. Yeah, a lot of little things that we don't consider. All right, well, let's uh, just bow our heads for a moment. And, uh, you know, Pastor Jason, uh, I, I, we good-naturedly give each other a hard time uh, about this. I am more of a power prayer guy in terms of it'll be short and sweet and right to the point because I know the Holy Spirit's going to carry the mail for me. And uh, uh, Pastor is a great lengthy prayer <laughs> saying a prayer anyway uh, but both have the power of God behind them and that's what's important so let's just pray to the Lord for a moment Lord oh I'm sorry prayer request attacking all of our leaders. So that's why they're getting sick and so on and stuff is going on. So Amen. I think we need uh, to really focus in the leadership. Amen. That is a wonderful and selfless prayer. That's good, man. I, yeah, amen. 
All right, yes, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we come to you and we're just grateful that, again, Lord, we can be here in your presence. And God, we're also grateful uh, for our lineage that you said in John 3.3, 3, we have to be born of the Spirit, and we were born. And, it, and when that rebirthing took place, oh God, we became spirit babies, and, and we were adopted by you, Jesus. And we became your joint heirs, oh God, with you, Christ, through that salvation. And Lord, you said that we can now come to you with our petitions, that you're seated at the right hand of the Father, and, and you'll hear those prayers, oh God, and, and you left the Holy Spirit, or, or left Holy Spirit with us, even now, to carry that prayer to you, Father. So we do absolutely stand on that, God, and we bring you the petitions of our heart. And Father God, while we know it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous, the just and the unjust, just the same, that they have the same issues, maladies, problems, and, and things going on in their lives, we, Father God, are your children, and we bring to you your children here today, Lord God, and the needs that we brought, brought forth. We bring to you, Father God, Brother Rick, who's going to have that therapy on his throat that I, I know uh, always gave me the willies, Lord God, as I watched it going on with my own wife, Father. So just give him strength and let it heal quickly as they stretch that out, Lord God, so that he can swallow. We pray for Sister Linda Weckle, Lord God, that you be with her. And Lord, as we think of, of the matter of housing and, and mortgages and jobs and, and establishing financial things so that we can be within this society and live a quiet life, Lord God, within the society, obeying Caesar and doing the things that we have to do because we know that that is not the important thing, Father God, but it's important so that we can have that good character of a, a mature Christian for the purpose, oh God, of being your representative in a lost and dying world so that we can speak into the lives of people that we meet in this world. So we pray, Father God, that you would work in those matters, that you would provide housing, you would provide a job, you would open doors, Father God, and then we also pray, oh God, for the horse sense, the Holy Spirit sense, if, to see that open door and to step through it with the, the courage and the strength that you give us, oh God. And Father God, <clears throat> I think of the leaders of the church, and I, I immediately go to my Sunday school teacher who has a discipling Christian, reaching out to others to bring them into full maturity so that they can reach out to others and bring them into full maturity so that they can reach out and Father God, the model that you gave us. And I, I think of not just Pastor Dennis, but I think of all our church leadership here locally, that you would be with the pastors and, and Pastor Jason, Pastor Nick here, especially Lord God, as they're fighting these maladies of the body, the bugs that done called in them that we are indeed involved in spiritual warfare. We don't fight just against the, the things of this world, but albeit uh, a petty problems, Lord God. We fight against spirits and principalities, Father God, because Satan would like nothing better than to see the doors closed, the people gone, and the outreach stop so that the word is stifled, so that people aren't being brought into the kingdom of God and rather are being led to destruction and damnation. So Father God, what a wonderful, wonderful request and, and I, I absolutely bring it to you as your son, Lord God, that you would honor that request of my sister to be with your leadership and to protect them and, and if it be a hedge around them, then build that hedge, Lord God, so that Satan's Arrows can't get through, can't penetrate, so that your kingdom be grown, Lord God. 
And Father God, we, we ask for your presence here in the rest of this service, that uh, the words that each of us speak not be ours, but rather be yours, Lord God, that your will be done, that the seeds of your word go into soil that you prepared, Holy Spirit, that you brought here, that you germinate that seed, that you grow it, so that we can have that Tuesday faith, that Wednesday religion, that Thursday overcoming victory, carrying us all the way across the week and through each moment of our life. We'll give you the praise and glory for that, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, I want to first uh, apologize that because I, I think I mentioned I've got a bunch of trials in the morning, so I want to save my voice a little bit, all right? <laughs> so we have three longer scripture readings, and... Uh, I'm, I have, uh, I'm going to farm those out, okay? <laughs> Sister Coyle's going to help me. Brother Byron's going to help me. And God bless you, sweet young wife. I'm going to give you Hebrews 11 all together, all right? Uh, and we'll bring you a, yeah, you, young lady. Uh, we'll bring you a, uh, a copy of the uh, Hebrews 11, and then we'll bring you a, a microphone. Robert, if you could grab... Uh, uh, Sister Coyle's mic and give it to Christy because she'll be up first. Hebrews 11. Well, uh, as I said, Pastor called me uh, this afternoon and, and he had to go all the way down to the C team uh, because Pastor Dennis was in Orlando, as a matter of fact. So I, I really, as I thought about this and as uh, I said my power prayer to God, hey, what do you want me to say? It kind of ties in with what he was speaking about this morning, that trust and that faith that we have in God. And really, trust is all about having faith, because as we were talking this morning, you, you certainly build trust over time and over experience with someone. So I want to start this <clears throat> by telling you that back when George Bush Jr., the Texan, was president, he signed into law something called the Adam Walsh Act. That was about 2005 or so in there. Uh, and that came about, maybe you all remember the tragedy of little Adam Walsh, the child in Miami, that was or, or one of the towns there around Miami. Uh, who was the son of, of a fellow by the name of, uh, help me out, the father's name? John. John Walsh. John Walsh, thank you. Uh, who was the father of John, uh, son of John Walsh. He was kidnapped, he was sexually abused, and he was murdered and left in a ditch. And John Walsh, the father, uh, touched by that and moved by that, of course, uh, what, he had been a television uh, reporter, and, and he, st he started a TV show called America's Most Wanted, and he would feature fugitives that were wanted across the country. Well, I was uh, a, a deputy United States marshal for 25 years, and when President uh, Bush signed that, like a lot of presidents, it must have been closer to 2008, they don't actually fund the program that they have signed into law. So it was when President Obama became president that they actually funded that, law, that program called the Adam Walsh Act. And the president, President Obama, gave it to the United States Marshals to enforce that. And so in 2010, January, or actually December 2009, uh, I took the role as chief inspector for the southeast region of the United States to enforce the sex offender investigation law. And I took over for, uh, and began the eight states of the Old South here, in, uh, excluding Florida and Georgia, and, uh, or Florida, Texas, and Virginia. It was a great job. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was a way to impact the world and to protect children. 
And really, I, I called it my millstone ministry. And I got that from Matthew 18, 6, where Jesus said, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And I kind of, I'll be honest with you all, I thought it was my job, I'll tie the millstone around their neck and I'll throw them into the ocean, all right? And I was just happy as, as punch to be able to do that. But I didn't get that job overnight. Much like pastors preaching this morning, I had been a trustworthy chief. I had proved myself, or as we say in the cop vernacular, I had made my bones as a chief deputy, and I'd been faithful as a government servant for many years. So I was trusted with that job, with a lot of money, a lot of uh, authority, a lot of agents under my command, and I was faithful to that job. My wife would tell you that, whew, man, I put my hours in as a faithful servant to the people and to the government. And so this afternoon, as I'm sitting here reflecting upon the pastor's sermon, I thought on that matter of faithfulness to God and, and how we can show it in our lives. And looking at Matthew 18, I was reminded of that faithfulness that we should have and the trust that we should show to God. And it came about in 18.1 that the disciples, you remember, they came to Jesus and they said, uh, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So as pastors talking about trustworthiness and faithfulness this morning, we really need to look into how are we going to show our childlike trustworthiness to God? how we are going to be childlike in that faithfulness to God. Experience and being faithful. When pastor asked that this morning, I immediately thought of what I tell and I'll tell tomorrow a jury of our dear panel, how we get to judge whether someone is worthy of being believed on the witness stand. And I inevitably tell them, look at how they conduct themselves, whether they were in a position so they could have seen or heard what they're saying, or do they have some motivation. And inevitably, in all those issues, you come to the matter of trust. Do you trust what the person said on the witness stand? And looking at that pattern of trust maybe in their life. And in fact, when a witness has been convicted of a crime in the past that bears on trustworthiness, like financial maybe fraud, or they've been convicted of perjury, we can ask them on the stand, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And of course, uh, if they have and they say no, whoo-hoo, man, we go to town. Oh yeah, you remember 1982 when you said this, or whatever. But if they say, yes, I have, then we just simply raise the specter that you have a past, and therefore, maybe we can't trust you today. We throw that doubt. So really, what is the testimony of our lives? And what is the testimony of our life that God is looking for? I always think of that saying, put up or shut up, all right? Trust God or don't. And, and we can look to the scripture to see how to practice that, all right? And tonight, because this was a, a little bit short notice, we're going to be a little scripture heavy. And I'm okay with that because, you know, at last I heard, this is the word of God. This is Jesus living and breathing. So we're going to turn, as I, I think of looking at faith and an example of faith, I always think of the Hebrews Hall of Faith. 
and there's this great museum, right, up in heaven, and it's, I think it's on the third day you're up in heaven after you done the in-processing. I could be wrong. I think it's the third day. You get to go to the Hebrew Hall of Faith, and you get to meet everybody in Hebrews chapter 11. Test, test. Okay. <clears throat> the entire chapter? Oh, my gosh. Is this voluntary, or am I getting paid? Okay. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended <clears throat> as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah warned about the things not yet seen. In holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteous, that is, in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was able to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and, the, and as countless as the sand and seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be ca called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the premise, promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so he, in a matter of speaking, um, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he learned, or as, I'm sorry, as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By, by faith, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than of treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. 
but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edges of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again, there were others who tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning, and they were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Oh, man, they're picking on me because I'm a Christian. Or uh, you, you get that. Read Hebrews 11. I am telling you that as you walk through that, I all, often think of this white marbled floor, and there's alcoves on each side. I'm walking by Abraham, and there, uh, there he's standing. And now I can talk to him on day three, and I can talk to uh, Rahab, who let down the rope, and I can talk to Gideon, who took... Uh, the 20,000 or 60,000 Israelis and, and under God's command took him down to 300 so he could beat the 100 some thousand against God's people. That's faith. That's faith. But, but tonight, I hope that you all as Christians read that as often as I do. And when you get down, you go to Hebrews 11. I want to tell you and remind you about some of the others that we might find interesting. There's the widow of Zarephath, found in 1 Kings 17. And Brother Byron, I think you got her. First Kings 17. Yes, sir. It should be on your paper. 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24. This is NIV. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath where he, when he came to the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called her and asked, Would you bring me a little water and a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of olive oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. But the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you bring, did you come to remind me of my sin and to kill my son? Pardon me. 
Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid on him and laid him on the bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even to this widow I am staying with by cursing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man from God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Wow. <clears throat> this woman, if you remember the story, she is down to her last crumbs in the bottom of the barrel and literally she's ready to go home and lay down and die and I love that story because it, it tells you a couple of things and of course the uh, story of Elijah is also about this it rains on the just and the unjust on the Christian and the non-Christian the same we deal with the things of this world just like the non-Christian deals with the things of this world like desperation and absolute giving up. She was ready to go home, lay down and die with her child. And then God, through Elijah. Elijah walks in and, and now God, because she trusted the man of God who said, keep the bread of coming. And, and I love that song, give me all in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me all in my lamp, I pray. Give me all in my lamp, keep me burning, 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 keep me burning till the light of day. God will burn your lamp if you trust in him. He'll give you that oil if you go to him and you do that. And she did. And yet, like Pastor was talking about, you know, we, we show trust in that little thing. Well, pretty big thing in her case, right? Of, of the bread. And then God will increase that and showed that her son was brought back to life. Wow, that's trust, that's faith, and that's what really is a good example of what the pastor was talking about this morning. And, and as I thought of that, I kind of skipped ahead in my mind to the year 2012, and, and to a, a guy who had just retired from the marshal service, he's sitting as a pastor in, in the office in Arcadia, Florida, and doing the books. And it's towards the end of the month. It's a Tuesday towards the end of the month. And, and I'm looking at the books, and they've got a mortgage, and it ain't going to be made. There ain't no way that it's going to be made. And we were talking and praying about mortgage tonight. The, mo the, the money was not in the bank, and I'm telling you that, remember, I, I, I freely admit to you that I'm not the, I'm the chiefest, I'm the chief of sinners, and I, I certainly have my faith issues. So I knew in my mind, my man mind, that we weren't going to make that mortgage and uh, they were going to foreclose on the church. Whew, that's a pretty scary, frightening thing. And so it was a, a scrape the bottom of the jar time. So <clears throat> I, I really, I looked at the books, I balanced, I rebalanced, I tried to figure out what's going on, and there is just no way that the man mind could take it. So unfortunately, I went in desperation, down on my knees, in desperation. And that should not be the time that you go to prayer, right? But I did. I went in desperation. And y'all, if you would picture a, a check standing on end, and it walked in the room. It just walked right through the door. There was a knock on the door, and a check came walking in with little stick legs, and that check was for... One month of mortgage. I said, wow, thank you, God. And about half an hour later, another little check come walking in the room, and it's another month's mortgage. I said, Lord, man, this is great. Praise God. Well, of course, it really wasn't that stick figure check. God used people. Who? Man, he used people that had listened to him and we were able to make the mortgage, restructure that mortgage with the Christian uh, Credit Union out of California. Go California for that, man. 
uh, and, and to save the church. But it was faithfulness that saw that mortgage paid several months ahead that convinced the uh, California Corporation they were going to work with us. And, and after that, God started blessing that church so much that we were able to hire a different pastor, Daniel, as youth pastor, and start to grow the church. But it was that desperation, getting down on knees and saying, God, we can't do it. Scraping the barrel and, and our man mind just could not do it. And I learned to start to trust in God in that case. And it should be easy, but it's often just when we get desperate. Sister Coyle, could you read the story of another guy I really like, Nahum? Now, Nahum was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man at the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master could see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, said the king of Aram, replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Nahum went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and far, far the rivers of Nebatna, uh, Namascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Amen. Naaman, a absolute Gentile or an absolute sinner, if you will, not a follower of God, 
is just really bullheaded. And so are we, so often. And it's the bullheaded that only in desperate times that we turn to prayer. And, and really, maybe, uh, I don't think I was so bullheaded back in 2012, but it wasn't my knee-jerk reaction to get down on my knees at all times in prayer, and it should be. And, and Nahum had, I'm sure, relied upon his own reasoning, his own planning, and it had failed. I'm sure he went to the finest doctors, the best surgeons in all of Damascus and all over the ancient world. He had tried all the cures. Maybe he drove down to Mexico to the clinic that was illegal for there and, and tried all of it. And none of it worked. He had all the money, all the power, all the authority. None of it worked. So in desperation, he goes to God. And then they say something really beautiful. And my life verse, and it's on all the insides of my Jacket says, Micah 6.8. What does God demand of you, O man? That you seek justice, show mercy, and walk humbly. And so Naaman couldn't believe it, man. You want me to dip into the dirty old river there, the Peace River, or, or the, uh, the lake here, Hancock Lake here in, in uh, Lakeland? You want me to do that? Seven times, buddy. And I'm sure at the fourth time or the fifth time or the sixth time, he must have been having his doubts. But God demanded that faith, obedience, even from a sinner. And it woke and it opened up the eyes. And finally, in desperation, he gave that faith to God. So tonight, we, we've looked at a couple of minor stories in the Bible. I want to look at one more. You and me. All right? Life happens. Life happens. We are all humans. We get frustrated. We get broke. Sometimes we run out of money before we run out of month. Whoo, man, I can tell you. My poor wife will tell you, I'm always complaining. Oh, man, we're running out of money before the month. We get sick. We lose loved ones. We face tough decisions. Life happens. And what is our knee-jerk reaction to it? That really defines who we are. And I know you, man, I beat this church up all about this all the time, and I say it in my personal life. I tell people, ask yourself two questions. You have to ask yourself two questions. So I'm not a hero of the faith. But you are. And I sometimes forget that lesson. Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I just got kicked out of my house. I just got fired. I got no money. I don't know how, now how I'm going to take care of my family. Give thanks to God, not for the circumstances, but in the circumstances. Thank you, God. You are my God. You are my king. I am a son of God. And I, I often forget the uh, admonition of James, who I think wrote Hebrews too. But the admonition of James in 513, and this is in the e English Standard Version, is anyone among you suffering? Here it is. Here it is, our, our knee-jerk reaction. Let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing. Have a lilt in your heart to God. You know, I, I personally get wrapped up in the things that are going on in my day, the moment, the problem. It becomes so big that I forget God has this. I forget for a moment that first question, who I am. So remember who you are, always. You're a child of God a son or a daughter of the king. My wife says it this way, you know, before I go into the, the horrible situation of life, I just pause outside the door, I straighten my crown like old King Charlie does, and I put it up there. I'm a princess of God Almighty. I am a daughter of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That is who I am. I'm a new creature. 
And then, as often, and I have often done it, I, I pause in that moment to remember to pray. And, and I've learned to do that more and more as I've gotten older. I, I know uh, some of our pastors in, in this church will uh, say, yeah, the boy comes to me when he needs uh, a great decision in life or he wants to have God in that. We, we remember to pray, to give thanks, to be grateful. So the Bible does tell us that it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous just the same. We have those same issues that the unrighteous have. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, in the wonderful Sermon on the Mount, in verse 43, you've heard it said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you can be children of our Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to shine, uh, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the publicans or, or the sinners do the same? And if you salute your brethren only, and I love my church families, I really do. I, I just get a juice out of being in a lot of church uh, families. Well, don't the publicans do the same? The sinners? But be perfect even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. We're to live under a different standard than the world is. We're to show faith in God, what God tells us to do, and then to do it. Go immediately to him in all things. And it comes down to this, Tuesday religion. When I come to church on Sunday, I, I, I really don't come for the pyrotechnics, uh, the big shows, the... the uh, uh, I, I like the singing, I, I enjoy that, it's great, and I'll sing to God when I'm walking in the uh, uh, forest and people think I'm pretty strange, but that's okay, I just, I like to sing to God. I don't come really, I come to draw closer to God so that I can have that same closeness when Tuesday morning comes around and all the doo-doo is falling down on, upon me and I can turn to Christ and, and be sure that he is there. So I'm not much for empty religious stuff, and, and uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, if you're familiar with me, you'll, you'll find that I love the very formalized Christian uh, things that we do in, in a, uh, a formal Christian service. It's not that I just love those formal church services. What I mean by that is when we go to church, we attend a service, and then go home unchanged, unchallenged, and unmoved, it was a waste of time. So I truly believe that our, what our pastor pr preached this morning is about having a Tuesday religion. How to live our life, how to conduct ourselves each day of the week. And for me, it's the same, and, and truth be told, I, I think it was the same for Jesus, that he preached about, he wasn't much of a guy for loving the Pharisees and Sadducees and all the, the doodads that meant nothing that they were putting out. He was about that relationship. So this week, my prayer for you all and for me is to show that Tuesday faith in God, to trust in him in the little things and in the big things, that simple childlike faith that we are to have as we draw closer to God. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Lord God, we just thank you so much for bringing everybody here, and Lord, I appreciate the folks reading your word. And I, I absolutely pray that the word just dwell in our hearts and that we carry it with us, that we be changed, moved, and motivated as we leave here tonight, throughout this week, to live a good life for you, Father God, to be your witnesses in a lost and dying world. We thank you, Jesus, for the time, and we ask that you be with us always and that we please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.